Welcome. Uh, I'm so excited to be here with Starhawk, um, truly one of the, um, a woman who I've been so deeply um, inspired by for my entire adult life. And um, for those of you who don't know her, she is one of the most respected um, voices on modern earth-based spirituality. She really brought um, Wicca and um, the ancient earth-based European traditions back into um, greater understanding here in, in modern culture. And she also is, one of the things I love about Starhawk is that she bridges the worlds of um, earth-based spirituality and also activism in a very powerful way. Um, and we met through some work we had done in, um, in the West Bank um, because Starhawk also, she and I both share a, a deep concern for the people of Palestine and what's happening there. Um, and so today, uh, Star, it's just so good to see you. And the conversation today, as, as you know, I, I was prompted to connect with you because I had read an article that you had written uh, from your time at Standing Rock where uh, what you said really grabbed me. It was that you feel that the deeper healing that needs to happen, um, that, you know, around what's happened with indigenous people here, the deeper healing that needs to happen in this country is connected to what, to healing what's happened in the burning times in Europe. And um, that just really struck a chord for me. And it felt like it's important for, um, for non-natives as part of the decolonization process to look at that healing. So I just, um, so glad you're here and look forward to that conversation. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. Uh, it's great to talk to you and get to actually see you in some form. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was very powerful for me to go to Standing Rock because, of course, for many, many decades, I've been talking about the need to bring together the spiritual and the political. That, you know, when you're a political activist, you need some kind of spiritual base or community. You know, that doesn't necessarily have to be an overt religion. It just means a deep sense of values and practices that you do to renew your own spirit and connect on a deeper level with that whole interconnected web of life. But if you don't have that as an activist, I think it's really easy to burn out because activism is not easy, as we, as we all know. Yeah. And so going to Standing Rock, you know, going to a place where the front gate basically says you're entering a place of prayer and ceremony mm -hmm. and where everything was done with that idea in mind was tremendously affirming for me and it was just a really really beautiful incredible privilege to get to be part of that even for a very very short time yeah, mm, absolutely. Mm, yeah. thank you yeah i I think um, I've been interviewing others too who have said that they came back sort of changed because they, um, they felt that they came back to a world where they almost didn't belong. And I think that's for some people who haven't, you know, maybe for you or for some of us, we've, we've created community around us or we've, we've, you know, we live in more of that way more of the time, sort of, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, what a powerful experience to, to be there. Um, so what, how did that idea come to you um, in terms of the, that need for healing of our own ancestral lineage as, as non-natives? Well, it's something I've been thinking about and writing about. I mean, um, back in the 80s, I wrote a book called Dreaming the Dark that had a whole section in it about the witch burnings. And having called myself a witch and identified as a witch for so many years, uh, that really came out of a lecture a friend of mine gave named David Kubrin on Marxism and witchcraft back mm -hmm. in the 80s. And he was talking about um, the shifts that were going on in Europe at that time, the destruction really of the tradi older traditional culture in its relationship to land uh, through the enclosures of the common land and the privatization of land, which was... Um, going on, you know, the witch persecutions were not medieval. They were later. They were in 16th and 17th centuries. And, you know, right at the time of the Renaissance and the time of the colonization of the Americas and this transformation from a land-based agricultural economy to the beginnings of capitalism. Um, and I began to see the witch persecutions as a way of 
stamping out, you know, attacking all of those old, really indigenous connections to land and customs, uh, to healing traditions that had come down through generations um, connected to herbs and connected to the natural world. Um, the witches were the shamans, the healers, the medicine people, you could say, right. um, the tr you know, the ones who retained some of the memory of the old uh, earth-centered and goddess-centered traditions from Europe. And so the persecutions were like an ideological war yeah. on all of that. And they were an actual physical war, particularly on women. Um, but also there were men who were also burned as witches. Um, but on the lower classes by the upper classes. Right. Um, Sylvia Federici has an incredible book called Caliban and the Witch that talks about all of this, you know, and how they play into the rise of capitalism and also how the same charges and the same ideology played into the colonization here in the Americas and Turtle right. Island um, and the African slave trade um, and just really how much the current capitalist system is built on this tremendous history of violence. I think it's really important for people who have European her heritage to know about this yes. because it's like an unhealed trauma in our mm -hmm. psyche. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes up in the ways that we think about women, especially powerful women. And I really saw that in the last elections, um, you know, in the ways that Hillary Clinton was demonized you know it's not that i like all of her policies and it's not that um i don't and you know i understand how people see her as a representative of the neoliberal whatever but there was a quality to the virulence people had about her that had not you know that never comes out against male politicians um right you know especially against one who in many ways also stood for so many good values. Yes. No. Yeah. And I think that goes back to this tremendous fear we have about powerful women. Mm -hmm. you know, the woman of power is so easily turned into a demonic, fearful icon. Absolutely. Well, and that kind of ties in as well to part of the, the, the theme of this webinar, or part of the intent mm -hmm. is to look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy, you know, their their governing structure was so deeply influential to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. but the piece that was missing was the the clan mothers, yeah. um, the elder mm -hmm. women who had such a powerful position of leadership, and to envision and to imagine, you know, let's let's bring them in, let's call them, let's invite them in, because it's time, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and really, for them to be part of the the field, to bring them into the field. So. Yeah, I appreciate so much what you're saying and, and that you're bringing it to women as well. Mm -hmm. And I just think that what what would you say in turn, because so often when I work with Native people or I speak to them, they'll say something like, um, you know, you really need to get in touch with your own roots. Uh -huh. You're not always appropriating our culture. There's this big attraction. So how do how do we get back to our own roots? And, and, and specifically in this situation, how is it that um, we can begin to heal that that wound of what happened to our, our own ancestors who were at one time also earth-based what do you have any ideas about how we do that collectively yeah. i see a lot of young people especially people who come from european background or don't see themselves as native or indigenous being really like distressed and confused about how do i show up in a good way yeah and i think it's important to understand like everybody has indigenous roots yes yeah you know, everyone on the planet like we would not be alive if we didn't come from ancestors who were indigenous to somewhere right. and knew how to live with the land <laughs> and how to listen to the land and how to work with nature that's how people survived um i think we also you know we get taught history in a certain way um, 
probably everybody knows who Henry VIII is, who's listening to this, at least roughly. Right. But how many people know who John Ball was or Isabel Gowdy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get taught the history of kings and nobles and wars, but we don't get taught about the thousands of peasant rebellions and worker rebellions that took place all over Europe uh, from the early Middle Ages on that really never stopped uh, when people rose up and said, you know, enough of this. Like, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's important to recover that heritage. We don't know about the witch persecutions and we don't know about the instances of resistance to them. Right. Um, and I think it's important that people go even deeper and understand that behind all that, you know, in Europe, again, as in every place on the earth, there is this rich heritage of how people connected to the land, how they listen to the land. Uh, it comes down to us and through things like folk customs, yeah. um, fairy tales, you know, you can learn to decode them, uh, history, ancient figurines. Um, but I think when, you know, healing traditions and herbal traditions and magical traditions. Yes. And I think when we start to look into that, then again, um, we can start to recover some of the pride and the heritage that we all share. And I think it goes native and non-native. Heritage is not just your bloodline. <laughs> right. Um, you know, all of us who are listening to this webinar who speak English in our everyday lives share a common heritage through that language. Mm -hmm. That ties in, again, to the whole history of all of the invasions and colonizations and right. resistances and all of those things. And I think when we understand that, then we actually become better advocates for people who are living in indigenous lives today or who are much closer in time to that violent, brutal colonization, right. um, to people who are still fighting those struggles for land and sovereignty uh, this very day, which are, you know, obviously are still going on all around us. Absolutely. Yes. In New York and Palestine and everywhere else. Yes. Mm, yeah. Star, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to leave with? Uh, I think this is a really incredible moment to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> this is a moment where, you know, everything we do matters because we either make this tremendous shift in our not just in our consciousness, but our consciousness has to pave the way for a <coughs> shift in our food growing techniques and our um, industry and our economy and our energy systems. All of those things need to shift and transition uh, or we spiral down into unbelievable destruction on mass, mass levels. So. Um, it's one reason I spend a lot of time teaching permaculture. Yes. Um, you know, we see climate change and we see these things as massive ecosystem degradation. And that ecosystem includes the social and political aspects yes. of the ecosystem. And the key to it is massive ecosystem regeneration. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. And the good news yeah. is we, we actually know how to do that. We have the tools to do that. The only thing stopping us is those political and social uh, and economic interests. So Absolutely. Um, it's, I find it a very exciting moment to be alive. Awesome. Thank you. I love that you end that way. <laughs> I feel you. Thank you so much, Star. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you. You're welcome. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you.